Hello, it's a pretty lovely, lovely good evening once again from here and hope as always that each one of you are absolutely, absolutely fine. So on such note, we begin today's this particular session and this session is going to be quite vital, important and also very helpful to you. I am very sure about that because I have done great research in selecting the questions for today and in, this is going to be the fourth part of this ongoing AS MCQ series and uh, uh, as I have already told you that these questions I have selected uh, and I'm sure they will hold you in a very good state. At the same time, it will help you in revising the concept. And one more thing, actually, I have been receiving lots of what we call messages to release these sheets. So surely all the questions which I have taken in these four parts of what we call ASMCQ series, I'm going to upload it in my Telegram channel and tomorrow you will be able to upload it after 11 a.m. Correct? So uh, by 11 a.m. I will be able to upload it and then you can draw it out and then also you are demanding what we call the paper, past paper series analysis which I did uh, but I did it in a very rough manner so it is taking a bit of time to solve all the question and then type them and then to actually release so most probably within a day or two I will also upload that too. So on such count we begin today's this particular session but before we begin let me also tell you you please subscribe another channel by the name of I'm writing here CMA Virtual Planet. You immediately subscribe this particular channel also CMA Virtual Planet. Correct. Why I am saying so? Because it could be a possibility that henceforth I may upload whatever videos related to CMA courses only on this channel. So, your first task should be to immediately subscribe CMA Virtual Planet. Correct. This is the new channel, of course. Uh, so, now we come straight away to the point to begin today's this particular session. Rama Limited has provided the following information. This question has been taken from AS22. Correct? AS22, existing standard AS22 I'm talking about, which relates to income taxes. Now, question first of all states that depreciation as per accounting records is 2 lakh and depreciation as per income tax record is rupees 5 lakh. Further, one more information is given in the question. That is unamortized preliminary expenses as per tax record is 30,000. There is adequate evidence of future profit sufficiency. That means in future we may have sufficient amount of profits. So no problem in creating deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability. Now the question is simply asking how much deferred tax asset or liability this entity should create. Presuming your tax rate is 50%. So how, how you are going to determine? First of all, look carefully. This is the first information depreciation as per accounting records is 2 lakh. Now, depreciation as per accounting record is 2 lakh and depreciation as per income tax record is 5 lakh. At least you can infer and conclude that you have charged lesser depreciation in accounts. Because you have charged only 2 lakh while computing the accounting profit, you simply subtracted 2 lakh. While under taxation, you subtracted rupees 5 lakh. Now, on account of this, what will happen? Think for a while. Will your accounting income be higher or lower in comparison to taxable income? When you are charging or subtracting only 2 lakh while computing the accounting profit, automatically it means the accounting income will be higher. Now because of this particular fact, what is happening? Accounting income, I am talking about accounting income, is higher in comparison, in comparison to taxable income. Why? Because we have subtracted lesser amount of depreciation in comparison to what we call taxation. So, when your accounting income is higher, quite obviously your tax liability will be higher in comparison to tax liability computed by the taxation authority. So, your tax liability as per accounts is higher, but tax liability as per taxation authority is less but the important point is that you will have to pay the tax as determined by the taxation authority. Because you are going to pay the tax as per tax determined by the taxation authority, it means you are paying lesser taxes which otherwise you would have had because your taxation, 
your tax uh, amount must be your taxable amount must be higher in account in comparison to taxable income the reason being is very simple because your accounting income is more than what we call taxable income your accounting income is more so obviously your accounting tax is higher in comparison to what we call tax as determined by the taxation taxation authority so that means even though your taxable uh, uh, your tax amount is higher as per account still you are going to pay right now less tax because the tax tax as per taxable income is less so that means right now you are getting a benefit but ultimately even though you today you are paying lesser taxes but tomorrow you will have to pay higher taxes because tomorrow you will have to pay higher taxes this will give rise to deferred tax liability so your first point is that you will take the difference of these two items 3 lakh and you simply multiply it with the tax rate which happens to be your 50 percent so it will be a case of deferred tax liability i told you uh, the reasoning behind that also correct now coming over to the second point the second point is unamortized preliminary tax records now what does it mean actually first of all unamortized preliminary expenses as per taxation records that mean in accounts we have completely written off preliminary expenses if in accounts if in accounts you have completely written off if in accounts you have completely written off preliminary expenses that mean now you are not going to subtract when you are going to compute a, what we call your income as per account so whatever your income is there as per accounts in the current year you are not going to subtract preliminary expenses because there is no amortization is left to be done in accounts however as per the statement given to us when i will compute the income as per the taxation laws in that particular case i am supposed to subtract now the unamortized amount of preliminary expenses which happens to be rupees 30000 because you are subtracting something while computing the income from the taxation loss obviously your taxable income in this particular case your taxable income in this particular case will be lesser in comparison to your accounting income because you haven't subtracted anything because question is telling that unamortized preliminary expenses as per tax records is 30000 unamortized preliminary expenses as per tax record is 30,000 sorry actually I just it means actually that in accounts you must have subtracted 30,000 but in income tax 30,000 is yet to be subtracted you have to think on such line amortized preliminary expenses as per tax record that means as per tax record is still something is left for subtraction it means in accounts we have subtracted this so now what is happening in this particular case our accounting income is will be less in comparison to taxable income because we haven't subtracted anything in the taxable income with respect to what we call preliminary expenses because amount given to us is 30,000 and this is given unamortized prelim preliminary expenses as per tax records that means in taxation we are still supposed to subtract however it automatically means we have subtracted this amount in accounts so because you have subtracted this amount while computing the income from the accounting records so quite obviously your accounting income will be less in comparison to your taxable income in this case because your accounting income is less quite obviously tax as determined under books of accounts will also be less in comparison to tax as determined by the taxation authority because your accounting income is less so in this case what is happening you are supposed to pay this much of tax which is lesser in comparison to what we call tax as determined by the taxation authority but still you are going to pay the tax as determined by the taxation authority that means you are paying higher amount of taxes today you are paying higher amount of taxes no problem but tomorrow you are going to get the benefit of it because tomorrow what will happen income tax authority will subtract this amount isn't it or not so in that case the situation will get reversed that means even though today we are going to pay higher amount of taxes but tomorrow or in future we are going to get the benefit out of it so this time it will lead to deferred tax asset
is it clear to you or not what will be the amount of deferred tax asset you take the difference 30000 multiplied by 50% this is what exactly i have done here so in this case deferred tax asset will get created so the net figure this is your deferred tax liability this is your deferred tax asset so net amount of deferred tax liability will be equal to this much is it clear to you or not so and i have written the notes also here So you can read through these notes also. Now, one more question I have picked up from AS22. When similar sort of question, actually we had seen under, I think, December 2021 paper. From the following details of A Limited for the year ended 31st of 3, 2023, calculate the deferred tax assets and liability as per AS22 and amount of tax to be debited to profit and loss account for the year. Now, this question relates to minimum alternative tax. So, you have to pay, because in my notes also, I have included two, three questions with respect to minimum alternative tax. You please pay attention to that also. So, here, first of all, you have been given that your accounting profit is this much. Your accounting profit is 6 lakhs. And you have been given book profit as per minimum alternative tax. So, in your taxation authority, you have learned how to compute the book profits, the book Book profits as per minimum alternative tax happens to be 350000 and profit as per income tax act is equal to 60000 Profit as per income tax act is just about 60000 So, you need to compute book profit as per minimum alternative tax which you computed to be 350000 Tax rate is 20%, normal tax rate is 20% and minimum alternative tax rate given here is 7.5%. So, how to compute in this case all these things which question has asked us first of all as usual we are going to compute tax as per accounting profit so you have computed tax as per your accounting profit also known as taxation expenses actually tax expense is equal to current tax plus deferred tax first you think of only computing the tax as per accounting profits if you are going to compute the tax as per accounting profits it will be equal to 6 lakh is your accounting profit and your rate of tax happens to be 20%. So, 1 lakh 20,000 will be your tax as per accounts. Now, we will compute in general usual manner after we have, after we have had computed what we call tax on accounting profit. Obviously, the next thing is to compute the tax as per taxable uh, income as determined, as determined by taxation authority 60,000. This time, income as per taxation authority is very low. So, 60,000 into 20% that happens to be 12,000. So, suddenly when income tax authorities found that your taxable income is coming out to be quite low, so they might have then applied the minimum alternative tax upon you. So, now they are going to compute the tax as per minimum alternative rules. So, tax as per minimum alternative tax. First of all, book profit as per minimum alternative tax is 3,50 and tax rate is 7.50. And you have computed now tax as per what we call minimum alternative tax, 26,250. After having computed this, at least you should be aware of this particular fact, what do you mean by tax expense? Now, tax expense means current tax plus deferred tax. So, first of all, we will take the tax expense, as I have written here, current tax plus, plus minus deferred tax, it depends upon the fact whether there is deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability. But general rule we write is tax expense is equal to current tax plus deferred tax. Current tax means, sorry, tax expense means the tax which you have computed as per your accounting profit which happens to be 1,20,000. And from it you are going to subtract the current tax. Current tax basically means tax as per income tax authorities. So, tax as per income tax profit is 12,000. So, plus deferred tax. So, now I can find out the amount of deferred tax by subtracting 12,000 from 1,20,000. So, therefore, deferred tax liability in this case will be 1,20 minus 12,000 that is equal to 1,8,000. Correct? So, this is my deferred tax. Now, how much amount I am going to debit to profit and loss account this year? This is the another question. Amount of tax to be debited to profit or loss account for the year ended 31st of 3, 2023. The rule is that current tax plus deferred tax liability and plus excess of MAT over the current tax. 
So whenever in the question you are given to compute what we call minimum alternative text, in that particular case you should be careful that meaning of current text actually gets slightly changed because generally current text plus deferred tax liability is are our tax expenses. But now our tax expenses will be equal to current tax plus deferred tax liability. Current tax we have already computed, correct? And uh, current tax as per income tax authority is 12,000. Deferred tax liability we have already computed. Now we will take the difference that is excess of minimum alternative tax over the current tax. Minimum alternative tax is this much 26,250 which we just computed and current tax is 12,000. So excess of net over the current tax is 14,250. So your total tax liability will be equal to 134,250. Is it clear to you or not? This is how you have to find out. Now there is very important question and I, I have a personal hunch, a question of this sort in the current year examination you may get, correct? Because this question is from leases and most of us actually are not able to understand or comprehend how to handle what we call such question. It is related to sale and lease back transaction. You know the meaning of sale and lease back transaction very well. For example, the for example, there is a lesser, correct? And let us say name of the lesser is H limited. And let us say this lesser, lesser sold a machinery, sorry. Okay, sold a machinery to B limited. Let us say lesser is undergoing through a financial crisis. So a financial crisis, acute financial crisis he is facing. So suddenly he decides to sell off his machinery to somebody just to get some money out of it. But at the same time, he also knows that he needs that machinery also. He is ready to sell the machinery and he still wants to hold the machinery. Why? Because this, that particular machinery is quite vital for the production of goods and services in which he is engaged. So what he does actually, he enters into a contract with Mr. B Limited, let us say. He tells to Mr. B Limited, I will sell this machinery to you at a particular price, no doubt about that. But what you do, you simply after becoming owner of this machine, lease it out back to me. This is known as sale and lease back transaction. Is it clear to you or not? So this time, actually, lesser is seller, no doubt about that, because he is selling the what we call this particular asset. And he is the buyer, no doubt about that. Lesser is seller and Mr. B is the buyer, without an iota of doubt in this particular case. But now, after getting the what we call this particular machinery, then B leases it out. So now B will become lesser and this person will become lessy. So technically in accounting jargon, we may say that Mr. B is a buyer lesser and Mr. H is a seller lessy. Is it clear to you? This is the connotation of meaning of what we call sale and lease back transaction. Problem arises where the problem lies actually. The problem lies is that if this lease happens to be operating lease. If this lease is a financial lease, then no problem at all. No problem at all. But if this lease happens to be an operating lease, then it becomes very difficult to do the accounting treatment. Correct? So this is what we have to learn out of it. H Limited sold one machinery having a written down value of rupees 400 lakhs to B Limited for rupees 500. H Limited sold a machinery and it is having a written down value of 400 now we come to know and he sells it for 500 lakh as is given to us and the same machinery is leased back by b limited to h limited but the problem is that this lease back is a, is a case of operating lease and i told you the problem arises when resultant lease happens to be operating lease now question is asking us comment if sale price if sale price of rupees 500 lakh is equal to 5 is equal to fair value 
So how will you comment in this case? Just pay attention. The, in the first case, what is happening? Your fair value. First of all, you will have to always compare the fair value under such situations. Fair value with the written down value. You will always have to compare the fair value with the written down value. Now you may wonder actually what is the fair value because question has stated that sale price is 500 and it is equal to the fair value. So fair value is 500. And I have written here. First you will compare fair value with the written down value. Because your fair value is more than the written down value. This gain should be recognized by H Limited immediately to its profit and loss account. Correct? This should be your first step. This should be your first step. Actually, in order to solve, in order to reply, under each case, because lots of cases have been asked, we have to actually think twice. First of all, we will have to compare the fair value with the written down value. And then secondly, we will also have to compare the sale value and the fair value. But problem here is that in this particular case, sale value is 500 and fair value is 500. So no further treatment is required. So only thing is that under case A, I will simply say that a profit of 100 will be recognized. You will understand it better now. Because in second case, question says that 600 is the fair value. 600 is the fair value. Now what is happening in the question? 400 is your written down value. Number one, your fair and sale value 500 is also given to you. And now question says that comment if fair value is 600. Indirectly, it means what will be the accounting treatment now if an asset carrying a written down value of 400 is sold for 500 and then leased back and the fair value is 600. Now, how I am going to deliver the answer to this particular question? I told you. You have to think twice. Under the first step, as I just told you, make it a promise to yourself that you are going to actually, first of all, compare fair value with the written down value. Last time I had a message, sir, because there are many students who feel comfortable in Hindi are listening to you, so please speak slowly. And that is the reason also, since last two, three sessions that I am speaking a bit slowly, so I do not want to actually just unnecessarily uh, increase the uh, speed. Fair value is 600. First of all, you have to compare fair value with written down value. If your fair value happens to be more than written down value, immediately recognize the profit. Profit of 200 should be recognized immediately without an iota of doubt. This is your first what we call conclusion. As I told you, in every case, you have to think on two lines. The number one is that you have to compare the fair value with the written down value. And then you will have to compare your sale value with the fair value. Now, in this case, your sale value is just about 500. Whereas your fair value is 600. Sale value is less than fair value. So, besides recognizing a loss of 200, you will also have to recognize 100 as loss immediately. In nutshell, you can also write rupees 100 worth of profit only should be recognized immediately, but this is better way of answering because it will help you in analyzing the things in a better and comfortable manner. Now under case C, fair value is 450 lakhs and sale price is 380 lakhs. It means now we have three, three values. Written down value is given to us as 400 in the question. And now question says that fair value is in part C. Fair value is 450 lakhs. And sale price happens to be 380 lakhs. So now sale price is just about 380. You have to answer now part C. What is the first proposition which you are going to apply? So we will compare fair value with the sale value. No, you will have to compare fair value with the written down value. So, in fact, here I have written uh, uh, 450 and sale price 380. This is just the thing which is presented over here. I have simply noted it down. But I have to think on such lines. First thing is that I need to do is to compare the fair value with the written down value as I just told you. 
Your fair value is 450. Written down value is 400. Fair value is more. Profit is there. Recognize it immediately. Now under point number two, you have to compare sale value 380 with the fair value 450. Now in this case, sale value is less in comparison to fair value. Quite obviously, a loss should also be recognized. Now if you become deft, then you can take the net figure also, no problem. But this is the way to analyze. That means these two propositions you will have to apply to each case to find out your answer. Point number D. Well, in point number D, now the situation is fair value is 400 lakh, sale price is 500 lakh and of course written down value will remain at 400. So now fair value is 400 lakh and your sale price is 500 lakh. Point number D. Your first step is Compare fair value, which is 400, with the written down value. So, no profit or loss should be recognized. Now, compare your selling price with fair value. And in this case, selling price amount I have forgotten is actually 500 in case T. In case T, your sale price 500 is more than fair value 400. This is the first time we are we are seeing that sale value because in all the earlier cases sale value was lesser than the fair value and the difference was immediately being recognized but now on rare circumstances if your sale value happens to be more than fair value your answer should be treat it as deferred gain treat it as deferred gain means i will treat it as a gain Every year I will transfer some portion, that means I am not going to recognize this gain straightway to in my SPL, in my statement of profit or loss account. Instead, I will defer this gain over the period of lease. Let us say period of lease is 5 years. So, in next 5 years, each year I am going to take some portion of this gain to the credit of SPL. Correct? This should be your answer. Now, case E. Case E says that fair value is 460 and sale price is 500. Fair value is 460. Sale price is this. Of course, written on value is 400. What you are going to do? First of all, you let me know. First of all, you are going to compare fair value with written down value. I have already told you. What is your fair value? Fair value 460 is given. What is your written down value? That is 400. Fair value had their written down value. 60. It, this is profit and it will be recognized straight away. Then what you are supposed to do, compare your sale value. Sale value is 500 with the fair value. Now what is your fair value? Fair value happens to be 460. Now in this case, is there profit or loss? Because this time sale price, uh, fair value is 460 and selling price is 500. So 40 is your profit. No doubt this is profit, but sale value is higher than fair value. You will take it as deferred gain. So whenever selling price will be higher than the fair value, in that case, that gain will have to be deferred. Deferred means you should not straight away take it to your profit or loss account. Rather, you have to take, you have to amortize this gain over the what we call period of uh, life of operating lease. Similarly, now you have got... Case number F also, wherein fair value is 350 lakhs is given to you and sale price is 390 is given to you. Suppose if I ask you to solve it by yourself, what you are going to do under first step? First step always should be comparison of fair value and written down value. Now because fair value 350 is given and your written down value is 400, this time fair value is less than written down value, 40 will be loss. Now loss or profit under the first proposition will always be recognized immediately, correct? Then under the second proposition, I am going to actually compare sale value with the fair value and sale value in this case happens to be 390 and fair value is 350. Again, there is a profit, but this profit will be deferred, correct? So whenever there would be profit under the what we call second proposition, it will be deferred. In the first proposition, whether there is profit or loss, it will always be treated as straightway gain or loss. This is how you have to deal with such questions. I hope it will help you a lot. Now we come over to the next part. In the next part, it is related to AS21 actually. It is given to you, HSBC is a financial institution. And it acquires 65% of the equity stakes in F Limited. 
and stakes were acquired on so and so date and disclose these investments that mean whatever shares I acquired, I am HSBC, I acquired 65% stakes of F limited. Stakes means I have done some investment. And now question says that these investments were reflected in the books as stock in trade. Shares were, and further question says that shares acquired were sold on 30th of June 2024. Actually the situation in this particular question is that our current year is starting from 1 4 2000. Actually, I have written here this is 23. Correct? This question is starting from 1 4 2023, and your current accounting year is ending on 31st of 3 2004. And question says that on 1 5 1 5 2023, you acquired 65% stakes. You acquired this much of stakes. Whatever stakes you acquired, these stakes were sold in the next year by 30th of June 2024. Now question is, should HSBC consolidate F, F Limited as a 31st of 3, 2024, which happens to be our reporting date? Should we? Now the rule is that, as per AS21, if we acquired majority stake, but those majority stakes which we have acquired are meant to be sold within a year, correct, are meant to be sold within a year from the date of acquisition, from the date of acquisition. Or simply, if those investment are, uh, if you, you have done those investment simply as a stock in trade, because you have reflected them as stock in trade in your business, it automatically means you want to actually sell them off at some point of time. So if investments or stakes, whether majority stakes, have been acquired with the purpose to sell them off after some time, in that particular case, AS21 states that no consolidation need to be done. So no consolidation need to be done in this particular case. Because we never pay attention to such things. So that is the problem actually. An examiner may actually ask you some question. And then in that particular case, you should not get surprised. Another question on similar pattern with respect to AS21 itself. H Limited acquired 65% of equity stakes in F Limited once again. H Limited acquired 60% of 65% of equity stakes in F Limited. And actually, you simply cut this line. This is simply F limited. You simply treat that nothing is written in this particular box. This is just F limited. Sometime actually when you uh, print out, you simply do the copy paste. So automatic, automatically some other questions line have, have been furnished here. So you simply go through this particular box. That is enough. H Limited acquired 65% of equity stakes in actually the name of company you change. Name of the company is Trinidad and Tobacco Limited. You have heard about this country, Trinidad and Tobacco. It's a very small country in West. I should not call West Indies actually because West Indies is a cluster of what we call a group of several companies. So Trinidad and Tobacco is a part of West Indies, you can say, and lots of Indians reside over there. So anyway, so the main question is actually S Limited acquired 65% stakes in Trinidad and Tobacco Limited. And further it is given that government of Trinidad and Tobacco Limited has freezed H Limited's accounts, H Limited's accounts and company is under severe restriction to transfer funds to parent company. Actually this name, parent company H Limited. In simple words, what actually I am trying to tell you is that if suppose you have acquired some majority stakes in a particular entity and that entity is situated anywhere in the world, whether in India or outside world. And some restrictions have been imposed upon that particular company by the law of that particular country, correct? Due to any reason that you cannot transfer funds, even in that particular case, no consolidation need to be done. This is the main point, actually, which, is, which I just wanted to hammer. Next question, again, is related to AS21. It states that H Limited has 65% of equity stakes in S Limited. 
H Limited is earning profit. H Limited is the holding company. And H Limited has got 65% majority stakes in S Limited. But your subsidiary company is earning losses. Now, both the companies have recognized their tax expenses. No doubt about it. Accountant want to know whether the group will have to recompute the tax expenses. Even though, because we have the majority stakes in S Limited, so quite obviously we will have to prepare the consolidated balance, balance sheet. Generally in con consolidated balance sheet, we simply combine the items and put them over, here, over there. However, one specific point is that with respect to taxation, the tax of parent company and tax of subsidiary company should never ever be offset against each other. That is the main point I just wanted to bring to your light. So profit of one company cannot be offset with another company. CFS is presented to give a true and fair view of the group. So holding company should present only the aggregate tax expenses in CFS. They should not actually reflect on net basis. That is the point is. Now we come over to point number, question number eight. Mr. X O. Mr. X holds 35% of equity shares in V Limited. Now this question is related to AS20, AS18, sorry. AS18. Have you heard about AS18? Re related to related parties. Correct? Mr. X holds 35% of equity shares in V Limited. During the year, his brother-in-law, Mr. Y, purchased goods worth rupees 5 crores from V Limited. First, we need to understand the transaction and the main question is, does this transaction need to be disclosed as related party? As you know, related party standard basically is a disclosure standard. Correct? Anyway, let us say this is the reporting entity, RE, RE is the reporting entity. Mr. X hold 35% share in V Limited. So V Limited is the reporting entity in this particular case and Mr. X has 35% stakes in reporting entity which is V Limited. If anybody has more than 20% stakes in another entity, it means he is exercising some influence in that particular entity. Correct? If my stakes are more than 50%, obviously I will have the control. But if my stakes are in between 20 to 50 percent, that means I am having significant influence. I am not having the control, but I am having the significant influence. In this particular case, obviously Mr. X is having some significant influence. Correct? On this particular entity. Now, Mr. X is having significant influence and what is happening? Brother-in-law of Mr. X. Now, brother-in-law of Mr. X. Brother-in-law of Mr. X purchased goods from V Limited worth rupees five hundred, worth rupees five crores. Should the transaction between the reporting entity and brother-in-law be disclosed indirectly? It means, does in this particular case, reporting entity and brother-in-law of Mr. X are related party or not? Try to understand. Main question is actually try to understand the analysis of this question now. Any individual whosoever is there, if he has significant influence over the over the reporting entity, obviously that person and reporting entity are related party. For example, in this case, Mr. X and this entity V Limited are related party because Mr. X is what we call having more than 20% uh, stakes in this entity is having some sort of influence in this entity. Mr. X and reporting entity are related party. Now, question also states that if Mr. X relatives are there and if they are, they will have some what we call transaction with the reporting entity, even those relatives will also be considered as relative, related party. But, but, you should know the meaning of related party. Who, under relatives, who are covered? Pay attention. Suppose this is the individual Mr. X. Then father, mother, brother, sister, son, daughter and wife. They will be considered as relative, not brother-in-law. 
So brother in law is not a relative. So that is why this transaction between reporting entity and the brother in law will not fall under the category of related party transactions. So need not be disclosed. This is what you need to understand. Correct. Next. Can a non-executive director of a company be considered as KMP? Can a non-executive director of a company can be considered as key management personnel? As per the concerned standard, KMP, KMP means key management personnel are those who have the responsibility and authority, of course, with respect to direction, planning, controlling. A non-executive director does not have the what we call authority and responsibility to plan, to direct, to control and therefore he cannot be considered as KMP. Suppose, why I am telling you, suppose a particular question asks you Mr. A is a non-executive KMP. So in that case, he will not be considered as the related party of the entity. Is it clear to you? This is again, in my view, important question, correct? A husband, and the question which we did earlier is also quite important. A husband and wife are controlling 34% of the voting powers in XY Limited. So quite obviously, husband and wife are exercising significant influence on XY Limited. Quite obviously, they will be considered as related party of XY Limited, no doubt about that. They are having a separate partnership firm and husband and wife are also having a separate partnership firm and this partnership firm supplies raw material to XY Limited. Is it a case of related party transaction? I have already explained this. Now reporting party is XY Limited in which husband and wife are having 34% stakes as I just told you. This is the reporting entity XY Limited and husband and wife are having what we call 34%. So they are related party. And because in this case, husband and wife are having a partnership firm and this partnership firm is supplying raw materials to this entity. So quite obviously, this partnership firm will be considered because this partnership firm belongs to husband and wife and husband and wife are exercising significant influence on the reporting entity. So all these transactions with the reporting entity will be considered as related party transaction need to be disclosed. 11. P Limited has 6 and this question was also uh, I think part of December 2021 or 22 paper. P Limited has 60% voting rights in Q Limited. P Limited is the reporting entity and P Limited has 60% stakes in Q Limited. So quite obviously Q Limited is subsidiary of P Limited without any doubt because P Limited is having 60% stakes in Q Limited. Correct? Now question further says that also P Limited directly enjoys 40% right in R Limited. So P Limited has not only got 60% stakes in Q Limited but P Limited has also got some stakes that is 14% stakes in P Limited. This is P Limited company. And further question states that P Limited has invested in Q Limited. Sorry, this is R Limited I have written. This is R Limited. P Limited has invested in 60% stakes in Q Limited and of course 14% in R Limited. Further, the question says that R Limited is a listed company regularly supplies goods to P Limited. And before that, there is one more line which I happen to skip actually. Q Limited has 12% of voting rights in R Limited. P Limited has purchased 60% stakes in Q Limited. And Q Limited has got 12% stakes in R Limited. Besides in R Limited, even P Limited is exercising some control to the extent of 14%. Further, question has stated that this R Limited is a listed company and regularly supplies goods to P Limited. R Limited supplies what we call goods and services to P Limited. So question is simply asking us, management of R Limited has not disclosed the relationship with P Limited. 
actually R limited will be considered as related party in this case. Why? First of all, you need to understand that. It is clearly given that P limited has 14% stakes in R limited also. Logically, if P limited will have only 14% stakes because that is less than 20%, that means this time I am not exercising any significant influence directly. Directly, I am trying to tell you. Directly, I am not exercising any significant influence on R limited. And if there is no direct, what we call significant influence, logically, in that case, R limited need not require, R limited should not be considered as a related party normally. But in this question, we are exercising 14% direct control and indirectly also we are exercising some control over this particular company. Correct? Indirectly, we are also exercising some control over this particular company. So, and our total control will be equal to 26% because Q Limited is having 12% control over this particular company and Q Limited is, in under, is under our control. So, indirectly, it means our direct control is 14% over R limited and 12% through Q limited. So, total control now effectively is 26%. So, indirectly, it means we are exercising the significant influence and indirectly, it means now R limited and reporting entity P limited will be considered as related party. So, related party transactions need to be disclosed. Correct? Narmada Limited sold goods for rupees 90 lakhs to Ganga Limited. There is Narmada Limited and it sold 90 lakh goods to Ganga Limited during the financial year of course 2018. The managing director of Narmada Limited owns 100% of Ganga Limited. Have you understand the question so far? There is a company by the name of Narmada Limited and Narmada Limited sold goods and sold goods to uh, Ganga Limited. We are not concerned with the amount of the goods that happens to be 90 lakh in this particular case. Further, the question states that managing director of Narmada Limited, Narmada Limited sold goods to Ganga Limited and managing director of Narmada Limited owns 100% of Ganga Limited. Managing Director of Narmada Limited holds 100% stakes of Ganga Limited. That means this company actually belongs to Managing Director. The sales were made to Ganga Limited at normal selling prices. Correct? However, no malpractice was done. So, general price we charged from the Ganga Limited. And further the question states, the chief accountant of Narmada Limited contends that these sales need not require a different treatment from the other sales made by the company. Hence, no disclosure is necessary as per accounting standard. So, do you agree with the chief accountant's contention? He management personnel or individual because he is managing director of Narmada Limited. So, he is key management personnel or individual and he is having control or significant influence over Narmada Limited. Correct. So that means they are related party. Managing director and Narmada Limited are related party. And because this company belongs to managing director, so automatically Narmada Limited and Ganga Limited will also become related party. And because they become related party, then irrespective of the fact whether any profit was charged or not, we will have to disclose the information. That is the point. 13 states that Mr. Raj, a key relative management, Mr. Raj is a relative of key management personnel and he received remuneration of 5,50,000 for his services in the company from the period 1-4-2022 till 30th of June 2017. That means for three months he received some payment and from the next day, he left the what we call service. Should the related, related party transaction or should the relative be identified as relative party? Because he is a relative of key management personnel. See here, suppose this is the entity. And let us say Mr. X is the key management personnel. 
because his key management personnel obviously is exercising some influence or control over this particular enterprise so reporting enterprise and key management personnel automatically will become related party not only that the relative will also be become will also become what we call related party to this particular entity because he is relative of key management personnel even though he served only for three months so whatever transaction which took place between the entity and the relative need to be disclosed is it clear to you or not x5 sold goods to associate company for the first quarter 30th of june 2023 after that the related party relationship ceased to exist however goods were supplied goods were supplied as supplied to other ordinary customer decide whether the transaction of the entire year have to be disclosed in the related party transactions or not as per as 18 transactions of x5 limited with this associate for the first quarter ending 30th of june 2023 only need to be disclosed as was the case in the last question now there is interesting question there is a reporting some extra point i have given here there is a reporting entity and let us say related party is h5 transferred services free of cost to h5 limited they are related party transaction related party it is it is given and entity might have given some services free of cost to h5 limited should it be disclosed because they are related party transaction whether transaction is given free of cost or at some charged amount so all the transaction need to be disclosed now there is another question that is with respect to what we call as 17 as 17 correct in this question it is given that vimal fabrics india limited has 10 segment vimal fabrics india limited has 10 segments and the share of revenue profits and assets of each of these 10 segments is given below the company has identified h i and j for reporting as per the view of the company segment h i and j are reporting segment comment on the adequacy of reporting assuming there are no inter segment revenues now you have to find out in this particular case in simple words which are the reportable segments try to understand this first of all segment there are a b c d e f and g here you have been given how many segments? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 segments are there. Here it is written that each of this segment is having 5% as the revenue. Whereas we know that threshold limit to be classified as threshold limit to be categorized as a reportable segment is 10%. But their revenue is only 5% each of these segment are having 5%, 5%, 5%, 5% as revenue. So total, this is the problem. So total 35% is given to you. This is total revenue of these seven segment and each segment is having 5% revenue. Indirectly, it means if I consider revenues criteria, if I consider only the revenue criteria, then I would say A, B, C, D, E, F, G are not reportable segment because they are not fulfilling the threshold limit of 10%. However, with respect to next two, the information is H and I. H and I both are having 20-20% of revenue. So that means in this case, H and I will be considered as what we call fulfilling this criteria so obviously they will be considered as reportable segment as per revenue criteria and then j it is having a revenue of 25 percent so even j will be considered as fulfilling the criteria now we move over to profit or loss criteria that is known as result criteria as per this criteria let us have a look 
all these segments are still having 5% revenue. So neither of these segments will be considered as reportable segment. Because they are not fulfilling the required criteria of 10%. However, H and I both are having 25, 25%, total 50%. Again, H and I are fulfilling the criteria. And J is also fulfilling the criteria because it is having a 15% more than 10%. So, now we move over to the last one that is known as asset criteria. Again, these seven segments fail to satisfy the threshold limit of 10%. So again, they are not fulfilling the criteria and again, H and I are fulfilling the criteria. J is still fulfilling the criteria. So company's contention is absolutely correct that H, I and J will be considered as reportable segment. Is it clear to you or not? Further, I have written here some detailed notes also. You can go through it. Similar is the case with respect to 17. G5 Limited has six segments and this time A, B, C, D, E, F, these are the segment and segment revenue is given to you, segment result is given to you and segment assets are also given to you. So how will you determine whether segment A, B, C, D are fulfilling the criteria or not? First of all, what you need to do is to total them up, correct? So, where is my calculator? That is the problem. Oh, oh, no calculator is here. Calculator, please. Let me see whether I have the calculator. Sometime I forget. Can anyone give me calculator? I'm just waiting. I might get no so far I am not having okay I will simply go through I can't help it I'm having one calculator but that is not in working so let's have a look over here I will total it up your first target to total it up correct total your what we call this revenue so you will get the revenue of the enterprise is it clear to you? Now, whatever total revenue is there, let us say total revenue is equal to XXX. So, if I want to know whether A is fulfilling the threshold criteria or not, what I am going to do, I will take the revenue of A, 250. I will divide it by what we call total revenue. And then I will multiply it with percentage. I need not require to tell you if this percentage is more than, if this percentage is 10% or more than 10%, then it will be considered as reportable segment. And of course, if it is less than, then less than 10%, sorry, if it is less than 10%, it will not be considered as reportable segment. This is a simple rule. Similarly, you will take B, you will divide what we call 520 by the total revenue, take the percentage, similarly 70 divided by total revenue, 50 divided by total revenue, and you have to go by this rule. Now, this is with respect to revenue. This is with respect to revenue. This is how you are going to check. I am simply taking case of one segment only, but you can apply this rule to all the segment now coming to the result segment here you have to be careful in result segment what will you have to do you simply cannot total 50 minus 190 10 10 minus 10 30 you simply cannot tell it first of all you tell the positive amounts and then you tell the negative amount try to understand for example you will tally 50, 10, 10 and 30. It will be equal to 50 plus 10, 60 plus 10, 70 plus 10. So positive item is equal to 100. And then I will take the negative items, the negative item minus 190, minus 10. So that is equal to 200. So you can see that total of negative item is more. Now you will consider this is as the base. What I mean to say is, for example, as per result criteria, if I want to know whether segment A is a reportable segment or not, how, how I am going to find it out. See here, I will write the result of A irrespective of the fact whether it is negative positive. 
it is 50 and then I will divide it by the higher amount. So that means I will divide it by 200. This is the point which you need to bear in your mind. For example, if I want to check B, then I will take the result of B irrespective of the fact whether it is minus or positive that is 190 and I will divide it by 200. And then same rule, if the percentage is more than 10%, it will become reportable segment. And if the percentage is less than 10%, then it will not be considered as reportable segment. And similar is the case with respect to sundry assets. You total them up and then compute the percentage in the similar fashion to know the answer. Correct? And similarly, now we come over to case study 18. Now, as far as case study 18 is concerned, again, it is quite an important case study. It looks innocuous case study. It looks very simple case study. But actually, sometimes we commit lots of mistakes when we solve this particular case study. Wintex India Limited has three segments, X, Y, and Z. Total assets of the company are given to you as 10 crore. Segment X has 2 crore worth of assets. Segment Y has 3 crores worth of assets. And segment Z has 5 crores worth of assets. Deferred tax assets included in assets of each segment are 0.5 crore, 0.40 crore and 0.30 crore. For example, in this particular case, only assets are given to us. For example, if I am going to solve this question, I will write X, Y and Z. First of all, I will write the total assets which are given to us as 10 crores, segment X 2, 2 crores and then 3 crores. Total assets are 10 crores. Segment X has 2 crores, sorry. Segment X has 2 crores. Segment 3, segment Y 3 crores, segment Z 5 crores, total 10 crores. So the rule which you need to understand is that when we compute the asset, we never include deferred tax asset. So deferred tax asset need to be subtracted. Question says that deferred tax asset included in the asset of each segment are 0.5 crore. So 0.4 crore and 0.3 crores. Correct? So that is equal to 1.2 crore. So your base figure will be 8.8 .8 total asset and you will consider 1.5 then 3 minus 0.4 equal to 2.96, I think, or 2.6, whatever it is, and 5 minus 0.3, whatever figure you will get, correct? You write that figure, then compute the percentages. This is how you have to solve this particular question. So all the case studies now I have framed, which I have taken during these four parts, and obviously tomorrow by 11 a.m., you will be able to upload it from the what we call my telegram channel correct so telegram channel link is already given in the description box kindly note it down and then you can download it from there okay then on such note we finish up this particular session of course as usual with the promise to hold you to meet you again at some other point of time